It's not just like, you know, the person climbing over there is a bit skimmish, she should eat more. That's bullshit. It is a serious disease and I have patients dying on that. Ja. Keep post. <laughs> Servus, alles gut? Ja. Na, na. Alter. Mach die Schuhe an. Let's check out the gym. Yes. That's a bed. Everybody sleeps here once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is the most important part of the house. <laughs> my kids grew up there. Uh, my cat stays up there most of the time. Oh yeah, well, Not yeah. bad. It's good for lonely winter nights. <laughs> the road's called Arts and Sport. And you see, this. The, the good thing is not only the climbing, it's a, there's no long tail there. Yeah. And the funny thing, when we went there the first times, we were too scared to go to the vaults because it was a dense jungle, there was nobody there. We were just with this little boat, only the three of us. It was super remote. Now there's a hotel. But the road's still <laughs> very nice. It's super crimpy. Yeah, the, I've done it. Yeah, there's a really cool eight But I've torn my tummy. I felt so sick. Vomited in the morning, couldn't eat anything the whole day. <laughs> Just got to the beach somehow and I was like, oh, rude from Polka. <laughs> 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 so that's the Bavarian. You have no idea what the Bavarian actually is. It, it looks like a plane hole, but you know, we stayed with Todd Skinner in 91 or 2, I think. And he was building his first indoor wall, a woody. It was like everybody who was there needed to make a hold. So the South African guys, they made a hole shaped like Africa. So I, of course, made the Bavarian with my brother. It's a jug from top and it's an underclay. And the Bavarian stayed there at Todd Skinner's ball for, well, until he died, actually. <laughs> so every famous climber who visited Todd knows the Bavarian. He adjusted a little edge on it later on. So then Amy, Todd's wife, uh, ex-wife, they sold the house and they moved along to another city and took the woody, the, the wall with them. And they built up the wall there and then sold the house, left the wall there. And then a reporter bought the house, not knowing that there was even a climbing gym. And she walked, she walked up onto the attic and found a climbing wall. And she, she found all the holes. And then she figured out the story behind it. And she has an article in the climbing magazine on it. <laughs> and three years ago, I was invited to speak at the Lender Climbing Festival mm -hmm. as the 25th anniversary. And when I got there, I found this at my friend's place, Sam, at, his, at the bed for me. So he gave it back to me as a gift after <laughs> almost 30 years. Great. So it's, I mean, everybody at Todd's place has climbed on it. <laughs> Even so cool. So it's older than us. The whole. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, this Not is, that this is your hole. <laughs> this is my is it's, our it's an external pinch. You don't pinch it. You that's just press it. <laughs> that's impressive. That's history. That's that's really history. I, I, I was I was really moved when I got it. Okay. So oh. good. <laughs> That's the Bavarian. Like a proper Bavarian. Some old holds. They're really old holds. One. You know, when I was a student, I had no money. We would just use stones and drill through them, but they were always breaking. <laughs> and some of them were self-made. Others are donations. Like the guy from Killerboard sent me like 50 holds. Yeah, it's a and Yeah. So, yeah, good holds. it's a good variation over the years. Of course, very Franconian over here, you see. Tied to finger pockets. Just how we like and, it. and in the old tradition, the old holes, they all have names. You know, in the, in the 90s, when we built, we built holes, they all got a name. Everybody had a name. That's dude, and then the one the other one is like Crank It or Yanker or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, why don't we take a seat and have yeah. a bit of a chat? So, we're here at Volker's place now. Uh, me and Chris and I, we already know him very well I would say. He's already seen me naked and he's already seen you naked probably. You haven't <laughs> seen me naked. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I think there was a time this when... This goes in a <laughs> totally wrong direction now. <laughs> he's seen us naked because he did already quite a few surgeries on us. Yeah. He uh, had my hip and both your shoulders, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I think there was a time we visited him like every Monday and every Thursday. I always say that you have a frequent flyer card. Yeah. <laughs> 
I almost had a parking lot once at the <laughs> clinic home and run back <laughs> because it was cheaper. <laughs> no, but he's been <clears throat> our doctor, team doctor and also doctor for every climber for the last... Oh, I think the official team doctor is like 28 years or something. I don't even recall it, something mid-90s. Oh. It's when I was still doing minor competitions and stuff and took over with the team. Oh yeah, how, how about actually introduce yourself real quick for... Well, I'm an old man, I'm Volker, I'm 57 years old, I'm a trained trauma surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, sports medical doctor. That's what I do for my profession. I'm also a climbing doctor. I I was taking care about climbers since, since, since I started medical school with acupuncture and then with like minor surgeries and then later on the, the real stuff. I climbed <laughs> since... since well, when I was 16 or 17, so that's almost 40 years right now. I still climb like three to four times a week on an okay level for an old man. And we still take it serious. My t kids take over a bit now. <laughs> and but only in climbing, not in running yet. Not in running yet, only in climbing and only on these little tiny edges. <laughs> <laughs> so in big moves, you still got that. I the still can do the big moves <laughs> for the next half year, maybe. <laughs> And you've also been part of the medical commission at the RPC, right? For yes. a long time. From the start, actually. So, you know, you know, before the International Federation of Sports Climbing was taking part, taking care of the organization part of climbing competition, it was the UAA. Mm -hmm. And that was with the UAA Medical Commission since, I think, 2000 or something. Mm -hmm. And then in 2007, the IFSC uh, was founded in Paris. And I was actually there. And I was in the medical commission ever since. Well, what... What are the jobs of the medical commission? Well, we, we are an advisory board, so basically we are a bunch of like, let's say, six to ten people, it changes a little bit, from various countries. And our goal is to analyze what's going on in the sport, and if we see there is a, a, a problem, we try to advise the board to take action. We, we, don't, we can't do anything, we are just advisory function as, as lay people. We are all volunteers, but like for example, if you look here, we have the mats, and the mats are now the intersections are closed yeah. with the little uh, flaps. When I in the ninety five World Cup, 90, 1995 World Cup in Munich, we had two bad accidents because the girl fell into one of the, the folds and the gaps, okay. and hurt her ankle and stuff like that. So that was one of the first things we did. That we made it mandatory for a competition that you need to have the mats covered. Uh, we do statistics on injuries, mm -hmm. we work with the paraclimbing uh, regulations and obviously we focus on nutrition and also on the health being of all the athletes. What were in the last 15 years like the things you achieved as medical commission? Well we achieved that we have uh, an injury statistics throughout the World Cups. We define the uh, team exams we want to have, like the exams every athlete taking part in the competition is required to have to get a license. Mm -hmm. We did all the maths. We did a lot of regulations. Like for example, I did the setup for Tokyo for the Olympic Committee there on the venue where there would be a, a, a paramedic, uh, where, they, where they would need to have a, mm -hmm. a physiotherapist and, and things like that. And we were part of some of the rules, like for example, an athlete uh, health status, where. Uh, uh, we can also test an athlete during a competition so he would not self-harm him. Examples, for example, yeah, I had this one girl, she twisted her ankle and we had no legal right to tell her not to boulder, but then she could boulder, but she could never jump down. And it happened the way it was supposed to happen. She fell down and broke her other leg. <laughs> so we introduced a, a mandatory test that the doctor in charge of the competition can actually demand from a climber if you think he's not able enough to climb. We, he needs to do a one leg push up, mm -hmm. squat. A squat, yeah, and or like uh, for the upper extremities, it's just like doing push five push ups, yeah. But if you had a shoulder dislocation, you would not do five push ups, yeah, things like that. Except Chris, he would do five one arm push ups, <laughs> he, would do it, he would do it on one arm, yes. <laughs> okay, and then the official talk of the event could actually say you're not allowed to compete, yes. yes. Mm. Okay. But it's a very difficult com uh, process always because, you know, we have an idea and then the idea also needs to go into the rules because yeah. if it's not in the rules, there will be always discussion. And we also have a medical check in the German team every yes. year. Is that the case for every athlete of every nation or are there differences between the nations? 
In Germany, we do the medical workup in accordance to the German Olympic Federation since 20 years already on the same level, even long before we were with the uh, Olympics. Mm -hmm. I organized that and uh, it costs a bit of money, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. Internationally, we do not, we do recommend the same test settings as the Olympic mm -hmm. Federations, but we can demand it because, for example, if you have a climber from Cambodia, Uruguay, or where the medical facilities may not be at the mm -hmm. same level, so not to have them in disadvantage, we just think we would want this. Mm -hmm. which is like you know cardiac echo and special lab results and spiro ergometry and so it's it's a pretty lot actually yeah so uh, for financial reasons we cannot make it a, a mandatory for all nations yeah but we have the the proposal they should do it and every athlete who gets a license needs a medical certificate okay that makes sense and do you have any idea if other nations that are at the top, like the Japanese, the Slovenian, Oh, they the do Austrians. the same level. Absolutely. Yeah. Mostly, mostly they do it at the Olympic Federations. Uh, in Germany, I do it still at my place, not at the Olympic Federations, because we do ultrasound of the finger. Some of the specific climbing, orthopedic stuff, yeah. mostly I do. That's why I see the athletes at my place. Um, but the big nations, they all do it. Yeah, I think you already ultrasounded my fingers more than 50 times, yeah. for sure. <laughs> That's to the point where you tell the ultrasonographer in the States yes. what he needs to do to get a good result. I remember we were on the phone, I was in Japan and also in America and the guy in Japan had no clue. And I was like, okay, folk on the phone with the ultrasound. I'm like, okay, I see this, I see this, I see this. He was like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, it could be this and this. Yeah, now it's even nice, I have a little portable one. It's like this big. We need this. <laughs> and um, you, you can, like, uh, you can do an ultrasound in Japan, and I can look at it on my uh, on my iPhone. This will be as a team kit. For I hope you yes. don't need this. <laughs> it, it's really a nice tool for all the athletes over thirty. We will get this as mandatory <laughs> team kit. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay, but recently you actually uh, left the medical commission of the yes. ICC. I think it was maybe a month ago or something. Yes. Why? Why? Well, since I was a climbing doctor, climbing is a weight-related sport. So that's the plain fact. So if you're lighter, you have an advantage. This goes to a certain point, and we know from studies that below 6% of body fat, there's no gain anymore of losing weight in behalf of being climbing able, mm -hmm. or climbing ab ab ability. But since I was involved with climbing over 30 years, I know people who have had what we now call a red S, relative energy deficiency in sports, or anorexia athletica, like a, a malnutrition. And it used to be only like a few people, and I had a, always had to deal with athletes with that condition. And over the last years, we saw an increase. Basically, since 10 years, we are monitoring the World Cups from the Medical Commission. Mm -hmm. Let's just define first what red S actually is. Yes. Red S means Red is the, the term comes from the Olympic Medical Feder as, uh, from the Medical Commission of the Olympic Society. Okay. It was defined in 2018. It means relative energy deficiency in sports. Mm -hmm. Basically, meaning you don't need to be under nutrition for that. You, it just means you do not supply your body with enough food and calorie intake which you actually burn. That's why relative, because yeah, actually you're relative. not energy deficient for a normal person, but you are for an athlete. For, you know, if you do 20, 30 hours training a week, you need a um, higher calorie intake. Yeah. And you, you, and you can be on a normal BMI or something still and be having a red S syn uh, syndrome. But overall in climbing, as it's weight related, it's not the problem that a guy is having a BMI of 22 and being that burly and too skinny. It's, it's, it's in general, it's, it's an anorexia athletica mm -hmm. where you just like reduce your body weight with the purpose of having a better performance. Yeah. How many athletes do you think at the moment do well, have we, a we, red we, S syndrome? We have really clear numbers because th that is the point. We, for 10 years ago, like 10 years ago, we started monitoring. Monitoring means we measured BMI, mm -hmm. which has its flaws and there's a lot of discussion against BMI. Nevertheless, BMI is still recommended by the WHO, is easy to gain around the globe, everywhere, has little mistakes, 
yes. they're fed, fed calculations, scale, they don't really and, work. Yeah. You just need scale, so it's easy. Yeah. And it will detect a very skinny patient uh, persons. It does not say that they are sick, it just says they're skinny. Yeah. So we measured for two skinny climbers with BMI. Then every uh, in every discipline we had one World Cup where we measured all the athletes in the single finals. And then mm -hmm. we made that a mandatory thing that you actually need to take part in measurements, otherwise you couldn't compete. And as we saw the problem increasing for two years, we, we measured more. And last year we actually measured every World Cup. Yeah, I remember last year there was measurements. So we in have every data semifinal. from the whole whoever was in a lead or bowler semi-final last year got measured, and it's yeah. in the database. And also we ran a study together with American researchers, or they ran it and we helped them on the female athletes of the World Cup circle. Mm -hmm. It was a questionnaire study on secondary amenorrhea. So when you say you measured the BMI of every athlete, up to uh, which number would you say this is a concern? Like how low? Oh, oh we, we measured BMI and later MI. MI is the mass index. The mass index actually is a, a, a head height to the sitting bone, which is actually more fair in advantage of people having long and skinny limbs and for some other ratios. So we measured BMI and MI and whatever was the better result for the athlete would, would be taken into account. Okay. And we were having BMI and MI cutoff of 17.5 for the girls and 18. 18 for the guys? Yeah, and then the plan for next year or active for this season would to increase it to 18 and 18.5. Which, when means, which means for me, I could go down to 51 kilo. Which means Kilos. Chris can lose almost 15 kilograms and yeah. still be uh, able to compete. Yeah. And I mean, Chris is not exactly what we call fat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm not your sure. I'm not your sure. <laughs> so what is red ass? And, and I think this is very important to understand. Meaning relative energy deficiency in sport. We said that there's too much, too less food for the body consumption that the body actually needs. So. Does it only affect girls? No, it's both genders, and I have patients always in both genders. Actually, and that's the point, we need to understand that it is a serious disease. It's not just like, you know, the person climbing over there is a bit skinny, she should eat more. That's bullshit. It is a serious disease, and I have patients dying on that. I have patients, I did the first diagnostics, there was a guy actually, not a climber, other sports, and he finally died. So, in young women, it's, it's the most cause of death in their young age. It's, it's more frequent than cancer or, or accidents or anything like that. So what does it, where does it lead to? It leads not only that you know you don't have menstruation anymore and you look skinny, it leads to bone mineral density loss. You Which have fatigue severe. fractures, it leads to kidney diseases, uh, kidney it failure leads in the end. to depression, severe psychotic conditions and basically around the, the body to it affects all organ systems. And at the end, what I see, and that's the point you, nobody, a few people only see, you know, I see them in my clinic and they are 40 years old and they have a hip replacement on the left side, they have a hip replacement on the right side and they have two fatigue fractures on the foot already because the bone mineral density is gone and you cannot build it up again. Mm -hmm. so, so it has long term, it has a lot of long term consequences. So we don't, you, you only see the, the dead guy for two years in the World Cup circle and then he's off the radar. But you don't know what, how it goes down afterwards. So basically if you have that in your period as an athlete when you're 16, 18, 20, that has long term effects for your whole life. Yes, the, the psych psychiatrists say in anorexia athletica or anorexia you have a window of two years. If you do not treat the patient sufficiently and with good results in the first two years, it's so kind of like burned into your hard drive that it's uncurable. Mm -hmm. So it, that actually is pretty tough. And uh, the long-term consequences are the really bad things. And then if you speak to those who had anorexia as a young climber and they are 40 now, they're not over it. I mean, it's always in their mind. Mm -hmm. They never come back to a normal lifestyle. Is not having a period a sign for girls that they do have red S syndrome? It, is, it depends, that's why we say secondary amenorrhea. If you are a young skinny girl with 18 and you have never had your period, that is in the in standard variation. That happens. Mm -hmm. Some start with 19. We don't really need to do anything. Gynecologists discuss if you need to do anything or not, but it's like, it happens. Mm -hmm. the, the critical 
point is, and that's why I always ask the, about the period in the team exams, if you had a normal cycle and then it stops. Mm -hmm. And that normally goes in the moment the weight comes down. It's, it's a body reaction, you know, the body understands, I don't have any food, I can't nourish a baby. Yeah. So it's a self-protection. Does it actually mean that those people also have a BMI that's below 18 or 17.5? Or in is ge there... In general, mostly, yes. Yeah. But somebody could also have a red S syndrome and no period oh. with a BMI of 20. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And, I, and you know, like a, a bodybuilder can have a, BM, uh, a BMI of 24 and like 2% of body fat, which they actually do when they dope in, in before the competitions and stuff. So it is the... the and, and a lot of people say you cannot make the BMI as, the, as a, a, a disqualification point for the competitions. And that's not what we want to do. So mm -hmm. the plan, and that's, now let's go, go back to the IFSC. So since two years, we have the best data in all sports on the globe. Better than in every other sport. There's no sport than climbing who has so good data on the competing top athletes. Okay. We have red ass in all sports. And I don't want to show climbing as the sport of red ass mm -hmm. because in track and field it's the same bullshit. But we have the data, so we could do something and we, we are obliged to do something. And since two years we are asked the IFC and they always say, yes, we do this, we do this. We need to have a regulation where we can actually, if the person is under a certain BMI, MI, we require the last two years medical results, mm -hmm. meaning they need to go to the physician, they need to have psychological evaluation, nutrition status, lab results, bone mineral density measurements and all of that. You need to hand all these papers to the medical commission mm -hmm. and we could look at that and then we could say, yeah, she's sick, mm -hmm. but there's no consequence. We can't do anything. So it doesn't so make any point gathering the data if there is no point where we actually say, okay, at this point, we need to stop him or her from competing out of two reasons. One reason is the self-harm of the person. That's the main reason. And the other reason is as, as important. We don't want an idol, a role model function of sick people. Which is actually... Kids. Yeah. Because that happens. I see kids who, who just like slide into anorexia because they think, well, what are you supposed to do? I mean, of course, if you look at the World Cup, we're all... Skinny, you know, skinny. none of us is fat, so and if you have, except Chris, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have no fat people, and of course, if somebody's motivated, the first thing a young girl or a young boy sees when he's climbing, oh, I need to be skinny to be a good climber. Yes. And also, if you are skinny, you're more li like you're skinny in the first place. Hmm. You may become easier into the top level climbing level because you have an advantage right from the start. But I, I had a, a, like a case I remember where the girl actually, she didn't realize it by herself. She just like dropped down and dropped down because she had this role model. Mm -hmm. And then if you interfere, you could get her out in three months. But you need to have a close monitoring system mm -hmm. and you need to get to a point where you say, this is it, we need to stop him or her from climbing. And the IFSC never, you know, we were pushing them and pushing them there for four years. And the IFSC always said, yeah, we do something, we do something. They promised us to do something for 2023. 20, we demanded that they would do BMI and MI measurements because last year it was all a voluntary work for all the World Cups. Mm -hmm. Some of the medical commission, someone went there and measured. Well, but you know, that's not what we can do over the years. I can't just fly to Singapore, measure for a day and fly back. We all have normal jobs. And so also, you IFC, don't need a professional doctor no. to measure height and weight. No, and it's the IFSC was supposed hmm. to employ somebody to do this, and they never did, or never even responded to that demand. So there were no measurements this year. Except the very last World Cup. Which we did then. Yeah. Uh, in Innsbruck we started. Because I was in Brixen, there was no measurements conducted until Brixen, and I, I felt so bad because, like, the athletes asked me, like, why don't you do anything? And and we do things since years. We're just running against closed doors, and then the only option we'd had would to resign. Mm -hmm. We, is Eugen and me, Eugen, Dr. Eugen Butcher, who is the the di director of the medical commission, and me, we were the main two people working on the topic. Mm -hmm. So there was no other chance. I don't want to take the responsibility to be working for an association who, who, who never doesn't respect the health of the athlete. They always say they do, but they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And we hope, and thanks to all of you, by putting pressure on the federation, 
that they were uh, going to be forced to do something. I mean, we need to do something. If you could change something now, personally, what would you do and what would you change? Oh, we have, a, we have the, the, comp the work's all done from the Medical Commission. We work with external experts. We work with experts from the uh, Medical Commission of the IOC. So there is, a, we have a regimen where you should actually measure MI, BMI, if somebody's underneath a certain threshold, we request all the medical data, including psychological analyze, because I, I am a trauma surgeon, I can do a diagnosis, somebody has a psych problem, you mm -hmm. need a specialist there. Mm -hmm. And then we would evaluate all these data, we have a special tool developed, where all these main data would be uh, gratified into a scaling system, basically, mm -hmm. and then it goes down to an, to an ample, to a traffic light, green, orange, red. Green is all good, you're skinny but good to go, orange is you can compete but we need to have you under medical surveillance mm -hmm. and red is you're prone for self-risk and you shouldn't self-harm and you shouldn't compete at the moment and then mm -hmm. she, she or her him can come back in half a year when he sort of recovered and we saw that in athletes that they were taken off by the national federation, regained weight, worked on their, on their, on their status and came back and probably climbing better than before. Hmm. And the athletes, I think, I don't know if you back it up as an athlete, but I know from other athletes who think that we should do something. What's your opinion? Should of we course. do something or is it, is it okay? I mean, as, as an athlete, you, you see how, especially young athletes, most of the time, they really want to be good. They want to compete and they want to be at a top level and they would do anything to be better. And we can see that people are harming themselves. You can see that they are not happy, that they're obviously restricting the eating to, yeah. perform, to perform better. And they do perform better, but it's, it's a bit, it's hard to watch because you know exactly now with this in mind so that there's long-term consequences. And of course sports is our life and it is important, but it's not more important than your life afterwards and your health. And I don't think anybody should sacrifice that. That, that is the good point because that's what I always say in my lectures on, on orthopedic, you know, we, mostly I do orthopedic writing, climbing, the climbing medicine, with the books and stuff. My goal as a team physician for the German team is I support the athlete. The athlete is number one. And if the athlete wins, I'm super happy and we have beers. It's great. But that's <laughs> not my goal. My goal is that like in 20 years, I can see you and you tell me, hey, that was a great time. And you know what? <laughs> I'm a dentist now. My fingers still work. I have a normal life, and not that they're crippled, and yeah. I see the crippled ones, so we need to avoid that. But also, in the long term, it makes you climb worse, mostly. Like yes, I you, think... If you just lose weight, you might have one or two good seasons, and then you get fucked. You, see, uh, you all know these athletes where you think, where did she go? She was top-notch last year, and yeah. she never even showed up this year for one competition at all. Mm -hmm. And then you dig deeper. And then you hear the rumors, and then those are mostly left alone. They just have, you know, their the friends maybe and the parents, but the pressure comes also from teams, obviously, and from some coaches. Not all of them, a lot of the coaches are great and responsible, but you know, if you're 18 and a coach tells you, you know, you did okay, but if you'd lose a kilo or two, you can be top three. Mm -hmm. What you do? I mean, you lose the kilo. Of course. Sure. As an athlete, you would do anything to be you better. You would do anything. I even think that the worst part is that it's so ingrained in climbing, not just the competition climbing, in the old style of climbing that you need to be light. But actually for bouldering, for example, I'm not really sure with that. Like, I climb better when I have, like, more weight and less weight sometimes. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, a sprinter is not yeah. super skinny yet. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. I'm wondering that the skinny... Climbers are sometimes so good still in Boulder. Yeah. I think and it's about the route setting. It depends on the route setting because if it would be all burly moves, they would have a disadvantage, obviously. And there was one point that we t which we tried like 20 years ago or 10 years ago. We would say to the route setters, yeah, please go away from this like endurance little edge, little edge where the lightweighted climber would be clearly advantaged. So to a more burly, strenuous move kind of route setting where you would actually need some power and we thought maybe this would just solve the problem by itself but it, it did not. I did feel like though from 20 years ago to maybe 10 years ago there was a change to the climbers were not as skinny anymore and the style did change a bit but now it's trending a little backwards to skinny again. Yes and it's also like 
see the pressure now it's Olympic sport you you are all are full professionals uh, you don't you don't get super rich but you get a lot of status and this is just part of the going on professional professionalization of the sport why do you think the IFC doesn't do anything then this is the question I can't answer and I, I did like 20 interviews now and I I don't know because the work's done, it's there. So you just need to take that and bring it into being. It's supported by the medical commission, supported by the athletes, supported by the coaches. Why not? One, uh, one idea would be they don't want to uh, make outline that climbing is a weight, has a weight problem. But that's another point because we I see mean, it in obvious. other sports. It's obvious, but it's also obvious in other sports. And we are actually, we have the data. So we are better than other sports. We could be a role model for management. So actually, I think it would be a good coming out. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of positive support from other sport federation doctors in Germany. We have an association of team docs, basically. And I got a lot of good feedback because of, yeah, it's good that we talk about it. We have the same problem. We just don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And I think we do how to know how to handle it. In Germany, we have a system which works. It's not in the rules of the competitions, but it's our working system in the national team where we would not send any critical athlete under certain measurements mm -hmm. without a thorough medical workup mm -hmm. to a competition. And the IFSC would just need to adopt the system which we proposed and everybody would be happy. Do you feel like the IFSC is maybe scared of federations that do not want those restrictions for the athletes and they're afraid of being sued by Yes, they are Metal afraid. That, that's one argument they always say that they are afraid of. But how do you know? In Austria, a minimum BMI is there for taking part into the national competition since 20 years. Was there ever a lawsuit? I haven't heard about anything. So let there be a lawsuit. I mean, it's the rule of the game. True. And it's not, you know, it's not a BMI cutoff. You just want to get the medical data, and then a group of specialists would actually give a medical statement and yes you can sue everything but like you know if I tell you your, hip, your, your hips fucked up it's a medical statement you can sue me for saying it but it's, it's still fucked up <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have you do surgery or anything <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get a very nice replacement <laughs> a sport hip replacement yes actually I don't do hip replacements <laughs> anymore no shoulders okay but you get also a good shoulder okay good I'm with two we can use a hip replacement for your shoulders so it's strong enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was a very intense insight into your world, the other side a little bit, because as an athlete you don't ever see this side, you know. Only thing, the only thing you see as an athlete is that there is, at least last year there was, and now occasional BMI measurement in isolation. That's the only thing you see, and then you always wonder, well, what happens with this data because nothing really seems to happen and yeah. obviously there are athletes that do ask well why do we even do BMI testing if anyway nothing ever seems to change overall I did BMI testing a couple of events and I never had a bad reaction from any athlete and I know that you are under pressure in, in isolation I've done that I know that mm -hmm. but everybody came did his part of it but you don't know, we all have it in statistics, it was every year it was presented to the board. Every year. So the data are out inside the community. Mm -hmm. of so I think, you know, the IFSC is a federation of sport climbing. So it's, it's our federation. They work for us. It's, it's not the antibody. They work for us. They are elected by us and they are kind of paid by us. So they should work for us. And we as a climbing community need to make them work for it. Well, hopefully this video will make him work for it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for speaking about it because that's the only way where we can move forward. Well, thank you for taking time and... Shall we go train now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs>